Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, botanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand and watercolor, tin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. Hello, it's Monday, a Monday Artist Week. It's time for the Artist Friends Podcast. My name is Clyde J. Kale. You are listening to episode 96 for May the 10th, 2021. And I'm here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everybody. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, too, for uh, keeping me company each week. Uh, this week, I decided it would be uh, Artist Biography Week. And we have talked about the Renaissance period. We've talked about other Renaissance artists, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael and Caravaggio. And we seem to tiptoe around or we seem to neglect Michelangelo, one of the prime uh, artists and prime uh, movers in the in fact when you think of renaissance you think of michelangelo because he was uh, very much uh, involved and uh, uh and uh, credited with the uh, uh promoting and uh, uh institutionalizing the renaissance uh, art period so i uh, found a couple of videos about uh michelangelo and then a third video uh, about the Sistine Chapel and the uh, uh, restoration of the Sistine Chapel. So for our listeners, if you go to www.talkartpodcast.com, that's talkartpodcast.com, you'll see the links to those three videos. And, and when you get the time, visit and uh, watch, and you'll see, uh, you'll see and hear what uh, we're going to discuss. Uh, This was our reference material for the discussion of uh, Michelangelo. His, um, how do you say his last name? Michelangelo Bonarotti. I think that that was his whole name. His his art, his life, and uh, he was a sculptor, he was a painter, and he was an architect. And I did uh, gain some new information from his videos. Diana, let's start this discussion with you. Did you learn anything? Yeah, I... Yeah, I didn't know that when he was a kid that he, you know, he wanted to do art all the time and his father would beat him because he didn't approve of that. That would surprise me. <laughs> but um, I guess he wanted him to go into some more standard uh, line of work or something. But but he per- persevered through that and um, finally got seen by some important people in the, in the uh, Italian yeah, area. You took my uh, 
you took my uh, point away from me because that's exactly <laughs> what I'm going to make that I didn't know that either. That uh, he was, uh, according to the documentary, he was his father severely beat him when he was sent yeah. to school for literature and philosophy. And here's Michelangelo, you know, doodling. You know, he's making drawings. <laughs> But uh, his father finally gave in and uh, sent him to uh, art school when he was like 14 years old. And some of the uh, uh, shakers and movers, masters, artists of the time, they recognized his talent that, uh, you know, his father gave in. And the world is the better, better for it. I mean, we are so much better. He was very lucky that he got seen by the, you know, the Domici family and that whole, I mean, that, that was such a fluke of, of luck it seemed like you know it's crazy yeah because that was when the it was the Mendicis were the you know uh, they were the um, prime motivators of uh, and uh, and the promoters of the artists at the time you know and, and uh, we have quite a bit of art because of them even though they were rather uh, ruthless also whenever I was thinking uh Michael Michelangelo when he was young the uh, Borgia were running the church and we hear people nowadays you know they complain about some of the scandals and the uh, uh, misdemeanors and uh, the uh, crooked crooks and whatnot in the uh, in, in the Catholic Church uh, today it was nothing when the Borgias were there <laughs> <laughs> murder and bribery and scandaling and a lot of them had you know uh two or three wives and lovers and illegitimate children and i mean it was just this was in my country when he was, you know during his youth you know and he survived that after all that but uh that's just another subject we could do <laughs> two-hour podcast on just talking about the the uh, history of the church and the, the the how wicked they were that it's a it, it's uh providence that the church survived the end of this day considering back in the 13th and uh, 14th century you know the, the issues they had uh constant what are your comments about michelangelo um i thought it was kind of hard that the church made him i'm sort of glad that they did make him paint the chapel but he really hated it, and I think that because he hated it, that a lot of the men that he painted were looked angry, and maybe that's why they looked angry because he really didn't want to be there painting the the chapel. Um, I don't know, maybe that was uh, that was new information to me also with the uh, uh, from the from the document of the two documentaries because each one. When I first uh, tried to trying to determine, you know, selecting, I didn't want to duplicate, and I did receive, uh, you know, new information from each one, and I forget which one is the first one or the second one. Uh, when Michelangelo uh, was a little bit younger, and he did a painting of a, uh, it was a, a circular painting of uh, a, a church scene, but he specifically because see Leonardo was a big time artist in the area at the time, Leonardo da Vinci. And he specifically painted in a style that was completely opposite of Leonardo. And it turned out that it was a style that no one else, none of the other artists, Raphael or, or Donato or Kish or any had painted in this particular style. And he had presented a completely new style of painting. Yeah, and uh, that was unique, you know, for me, new information. I never, because I've never thought of Michelangelo as, as a painter. I've always thought of him as a, as a sculptor, you know, which was his true, true calling. You know, he wanted to be a sculptor. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious when he wrote his dad that one time after doing, having to do that painting, <laughs> that he was a, a sculptor. <laughs> he, he said, you know, at the end of the letter, when he signed it, <laughs> he called himself a sculptor, even though he had to do this painting. <laughs> he, he did not yeah. like to paint. I mean, no. 
the col- <laughs> I mean, he's, the story of Michelangelo, he puts it, he's a sculptor, then a painter and an architect. But he liked, um, he liked to do sculpture first. That was his first love. He mm-hmm. l- could look at a stone and decide what he was going to make from that stone before he even started cutting away the marble to make it into whatever he was going to make it into. That was what was more so astonishing to me is that, I mean, he knew just by looking at the stone what he was going to, to, you know, sculpt it as. Yes. Just beautiful. Yes. So when you looked at the little tools that he was using to do it with, well, they were just scant, scant tools that he turned up used to do it with. I mean, today's modern sculptors, you know, they've got grinders and drills and electrical. Uh, Michelangelo's time. They just had these little picks that he was using. <laughs> they had their sweat and their muscles. I mean, uh-huh. that was yeah, the, behind the chisels, yeah. <laughs> the, first, the first sculpture I did, I, I did with marble, and I used the chisels. And you have to take such little pieces off at a time so you can get, because, like, I mean, and then you have a lot of sanding to do to get it you know, rounded off like he had, I, I, you know, looking at his sculptures, it's just amazing. And the size of them. Yeah. All the, all the delicate, you know, like the fingers and stuff. It, I just can't imagine carving all that by hand like that. Been very, very, it's very, totally amazing. I've seen the statue of uh, Mary and Christ. And I've yeah, seen yeah. the statue of David. And it's just, it's awe-inspiring to just look at them right. because they're just they're just amazing to look at, and the fact that they were made so long ago. I was uh, I've been very blessed that I was able to uh, stand in front of the statue that he did of Moses. I mean, now why did he give Moses horns? Pardon? Why did he give Moses horns? It uh, looks like one, but they're not horns. They're just the hair, you know. It's, the what? His, just his hair is stuck up. It's not horns. Are you sure? No. They look like horns to me. No. <laughs> it's just the way the hair curled. You see it in love. Uh, but, um, you know. I, I thought he even said that that was horns on his head. No. No, those are not horns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's been a long discussion. Historians have gone over it. You know. Uh, however, uh, I was I've been fortunate, you know, to stand like within five feet of it, and it is immense. It's giant, but it is so. If when you read stories of the Bible, that's how Moses probably looked, like you know, historical, like a madman, because he has the uh, the Ten Commandments under his arm. Having just been given the Ten Commandments, you know, he had seen the face of God, and yeah, can you imagine that? Drove him crazy. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it, it it's just Mark Angel captured it perfectly. I mean, and it is just a remarkable piece of artwork, and so huge and so detailed. And that's why he said those, you know, they look like from a distance and from photographs they look like horns, but no, it's just his hair. Blocks of hair that's that's that he got sticking out everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some historians have tried to claim, you know, that they're uh, horns, but no, they're not horns. It's, uh, that's I won't even go, won't even talk about that controversy, but that comes about because of something else. It's, uh, a little bit of anti-Semitism, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> but. Uh, I also uh, had the opportunity when I was younger to visit the Sistine Chapel. And I don't remember that much. Uh, you know, we had a video there talking about the restoration. I had went there before the restoration, and I was with a group. At that time, we were hustled through pretty quick. I mean, you didn't have time to spend a lot of time. And the thing about it's, it, I would recommend that anybody who gets an opportunity because then you will understand the enormity and the, the largeness of how big it is but you're not going to see very much because it's so high up way up it yeah <laughs> yeah so you know, the photographs are far better you get a far better i appreciate but still if i went there i would want to be able to not be rushed through there 
I would want to be able to stand there and look. I mean, if you get there, why not be able to stand there and look? Because Your neck gets it's such a vast body of work that's up there. I would want to be able to stand there and look. You know what I'm saying? Because now it's been restored. You know, so I can imagine it's beautiful. Tours, tours. Uh, when you go there with a group, you know, it, yeah, they rush you through. You don't get time to, you know, to. And I don't, you know. Like I said, being COVID, I'm sure they don't have any tours now. But when they yeah. open, when they get things get back to normal, uh, the Sistine Chapel because it's a functioning chapel of the church. They, you know, they they don't uh, have it open to the public where anybody can just go walking around on their own. They usually have to be part of a tour group, and you know, you and they kind of hustle you along so you don't get much time. Get a real appreciation for the art. Uh, you you should uh, you know you have to look, you know look at the photographs because you'll get a deep because you know, there's been outstanding. Now that's been restored. There's even more photographs, far more more beautiful. In fact, speaking of the, of the restoration, I learned something completely new. The one image which is supposed to be from the, the, the uh, from the uh, his painting of the Last Judgment. The image of that everybody have for centuries have said that it man's uh, where the guy is, is is crunched up and he's holding his his hand over his face and he's got a expression of of horror and distress on his face. Did you always think about when they were talking about restoration when they removed because of modesty the the church during Michelangelo's time. A few of the images were like 400, you know, images in that painting, like 400 naked bodies. And they had ordered, they had a, <laughs> who it, on certain bodies was told to paint loincloths, you know. But then in the 18th century, they painted even more loincloths, bigger loincloths, covering more. But during the restoration process, they went and they decided to remove the loincloths, but, but, uh, uh, most of them, all of them, except for maybe, uh, you know, I think they said only, 17 or whatever, but on that image, when they removed the loin loincloth, he discovered it's a woman. Yeah. Angel had painted a woman. And for centuries, people have thought it was a man, you know? I, I, when I looked at it, I realized the reason people thought that was because, one, the hair was kind of short, and two, the build of the woman was very muscular, almost like a man. Yes. And then the second one that they removed it from the snake that was wrapped around was biting Private's the genitals. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> wow, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of harsh. <laughs> My God, he painted certain messages because like you said, uh -huh. painter, he didn't like, you know, uh, yeah, he was kind of like ordered and pressured into doing it. Yeah, he was kind of pissed about having to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and on, on the ceilings, he, you know, he spent four years of his life, you know, on his back. And actually, it ruined his health because you know he had yeah. all problems and the paint, you know, and, and in his eyes and and uh, the. Uh, have you ever? Have you guys? Have you ever watched the movie, the Charleston Heston movie, nineteen sixty five, called The Agony? Yeah. The, about. Yeah. My favorite scene is when Rex Harris, who played Pope Julius, keeps coming and says, "Bonarotti, when are you going to get done?" And. <laughs> The uh, Charleston Heston who played Michael Anderson gave him the best artist. What every artist said, it will be finished when it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a true first impression. It'll be done when it's done. <laughs> that had to have been such a huge project, though, and, Gosh, and to awesome. have to do it when you didn't really want to be doing it. That would right. been rather excruciating. yeah, instead of being I mean, it was horrible. Yeah, I mean, he was a sculptor and did not want to be painting. <laughs> and they were, you know, commissioned to paint this whole ceiling of this church when he didn't, when he'd rather be doing sculpture, you know, so that's, that had to be rough. I mean, he, you know, he, he started, it's interesting, he started the, uh, the uh, burial tomb of Pope Julius when Julius was alive. And he was younger, he was like in his 40s. And then Julius poured him away to paint the Sistine Chapel, you know. So he had four years of doing that, you know. And then after Julius, Pope Julius died, his family members uh, 
they refused to pay Michael First of all, they refused to pay him for the work he'd previously done, and they lowered the amount they were going to pay him, and they also reduced the amount of – he had a grandiose plan. Yeah, to reduce the size of it. Yeah, of multiple, multiple, multiple figurines that he was going to do, you know, and, and they they just changed everything. And so here he is. He's, he's like, what, in his 70s, and he's doing – finishing up you know the tomb and uh that's why i think another thing uh the expression of moses probably reflected a little bit of michael attitude at the time he was <laughs> i'm sure it did <laughs> why moses looked so mean and and you know and frustrated michael saying you dirty bees <laughs> <laughs> It's a wonder they didn't all come out looking like that. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I mean, I, if he, you know, you'd think his his attitude would would have been reflected in everything. You know, I just can't imagine having to do something for that long in those conditions. <laughs> well, there was not something you wanted to do at all. Yeah, it was like the scene of hell. You know, that <laughs> really, to me, kind of reflected his attitude on the whole thing. Yeah. You know. They had like they said there were like four hundred figures that he had uh, put in that in the, the last judgment, which was a scene, you know, the scene of hell. That uh, and and they were all they were all nude, not a single bit of clothing in it. <laughs> that and he did that on purpose. He I was like he did. They confirmed historians have confirmed in his writings to his father, you know, and, and mm -hmm. friends, and, you know, his letters about it that he purposely that was his revenge. But then they, and I guess there was one uh, cardinal who was very much, you know, very conservative cardinal who uh, was very much, uh, no, you have got, you know, insisted. They wouldn't, they was going to refuse payment unless he put clothing on, you know, on, on the figures. And he hoped at that time, uh, uh, stood up for Michelangelo, did request a bit of some clothing loan cloths here and there you know in fact the mark angelo still refused to do it so they hired had one of his students you know paint uh, some loin cloths you know on some of the figures but the majority of them were still very much uh uh bare naked as they say yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it's it's interesting you know he, he is and then something else i learned which I did not know at all. I don't know why I didn't know. It's, I guess I haven't paid that much attention, you know, because I'd studied Michelangelo before. Uh, it, he was actually the architect, the project manager for the St. Peter's uh, Basilica, for the construction of St. Peter's, St. Peter's Basilica. And uh, some of the uh, work on that was some of his own work, you know, that uh, he was a really outstanding architect. You know, technical, technically, uh, you know, achieved and uh, did some because they had a problem with uh, of uh, erecting the dome, and he had resolved that. You know, he had come up with a solution and how to make that happen. You know, and everything. So, uh, you know, the 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 largest church in the world, you know, St. Peter's Basilica, and Michelangelo had his hand in uh, you know in, in completing that. You know, plus several other churches around Rome. You know that, uh, and throughout Italy, you know, and, and he was uh, uh, very much uh, involved in. So he's a sculptor, he's a painter, and he's an architect. Truly, a Renaissance man, you know, in every sense of the word. And yeah, it is amazing that he was so well accomplished. As you know, I mean, since sculpture was his thing, that he was so accomplished at painting and architecture too. You know, it's, it doesn't happen every day. <laughs> it's interesting. His, his competition at the time was Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci and, you know, and, and, and a few others there. He was, he, he, and he was, he was, he was a bit vain because he was always going up against uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci and he would do usually the opposite of what Leonardo did. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that was, that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of some of our artists nowadays. You know, we've got, you know, Damien Hurst and uh, G. 
Jeff Coons and some of these others, you know, they're trying, it's like they're trying to outdo each other, you know, <laughs> just like back in the Renaissance period, you know, <laughs> but that's about it. We got anything else to talk about Michelangelo? <laughs> no, I think it was about it. Okay. That covers it. <laughs> that covers it. All right. Yeah. Well, you've been listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 96 for May the 10th, 2021. And we've been talking about the great Michelangelo, his life, his work. And uh, like I said, if you go to www.talkartpodcast.com, talkartpodcast.com, you'll see the links to the videos that uh, we were talking about. And if you don't know anything about Mike and Inch at all, um, there's an opportunity there. Some great video that shows his art and uh, the uh, commentary and, and about his life and uh, how some of his work came about, came about. So I'm going to say goodbye to Diane and Constance. We'll let Diane say bye to all of our listeners. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Constance. Good night, everybody. And it's your turn, Constance. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Dan. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks to everybody for listening. And as always, if you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up rating, a positive star rating, however you uh, find this podcast. Until next week. Bye, folks. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or a star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.